Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. This time we're going to be doing a novel by one of the great science fiction authors Stanislaw Lem and it was published in 1964 and it's called The Invincible. It was originally published in Polish and then translated to German and then to English. Before we start, those of you who haven't subscribed, please consider doing so and drop us a comment and give us a thumbs up and now let's get into the novel. The Invincible is a class 2 cruiser that is stationed on a base in a Lyra constellation. It has a crew of 83 men. They have been in hibernation from their base towards their target which is in orbit around a red dwarf star. Once it got close to their target, the planet reaches 3, it dropped below light speed and awakened the crew who then got busy landing the ship on the planet. Once they had landed, the captain, Horpak, ordered a degree 3 which means that a full force shield would be placed around the ship. They were there to see what happened to their sister ship, the Condor. A year ago, it landed on this same planet. The Condor reported that its landing was successful and that they were exiting onto the land to explore. 40 hours later, they received another message in Morse code that made no sense. Then they heard some strange sounds and then nothing. So the Invincible is here to find out what happened and to initiate a rescue if possible. After the force shield was in place creating a dome around the ship, the second in command Mr. Rohan and two crew members Mr. Blank and Mr. Jordan along with a robot went outside to examine the ship and to take samples of the surrounding area. Once they had taken their readings and gone back in, the readings showed them that there was no radioactivity, no bacteria, no viruses, no spores and no funguses and the atmosphere contained 16% oxygen and 4% methane. The next thing they did was to send a couple of surveillance planes up into orbit to take pictures. One thing that surprised them is that with an atmosphere with 4% methane and 16% oxygen when they landed their exhaust should have caused an explosion but it didn't. The captain and Mr. Rohan went to the lab where their scientists told them that the methane was not regular methane. It will only react to the oxygen in the presence of a catalyst. They told them that the carbon in the methane came from an organic source and that they weren't sure where the methane was coming from. Mr. Rohan led a team to the ocean which was over 100 kilometers away. They discovered that there were organisms resembling bony fish living in the ocean. They captured one and they also found something that resembled seaweed or algae. They took a sample of that and they also discovered a colony of bush-like creatures. The only thing they found that was different about the creatures was that they had an organ that was extremely sensitive to the magnetic fields and they seemed to stay away from the land. When Mr. Rohan contacted the Invincible, he was told that they think they found the area where the Condor landed and he began heading back. When they returned to the Invincible, they found out that the sighting of the Condor was a case of mistaken identity. The Condor had not yet been found. What they had found instead, at first glance, seems to be the ruins of a city. Once the ruins were discovered, the captain gave orders that they were to leave to go closer to the city. So within two hours, they had packed up and left for a destination that would take them closer to the ruins. Once they had left, uh, most traces of them had once again been buried in the shifting sands. Out of the west came a dark cloud that came over the former landing site and stayed there. And as night fell, a black rain began to fall over the former landing site. The new site that the Invincible landed at was about three and a half miles to the north of the outer limits of the ruins. An expedition was quickly put together that involved five rovers and one mobile antimatter cannon. The leader of the expedition was Rohan. Two of the rovers were manned and three were unmanned. As they got closer, they realized that what they were seeing was not the ruins of a city. No windows or doors could be seen. Some of the ruins looked like 
densely tangled nets that were folded over and crisscrossing each other from every direction and at the places where they intersected was the thicker points. Other parts looked like honeycombs with three or five sided holes. They eventually reached a titanic fissure that was about a hundred yards wide and seemed to be bottomless. The entire thing was made of metal and they could tell that it was extremely old. It obviously was not a city, but what it was they didn't know and it was as puzzling as everything else, like the fact that there was no life on land, but there was life in the oceans. And none of the sea creatures even came close to the land if they could help it. The scientists were beginning to believe among themselves that there was something that was preventing life from leaving the water to come on land. Even the coastal areas were devoid of life. Then Rohan got a message from the captain. The other team had found a condor. It was like 180 miles away. When they got to the condor, they found that the ramp to access the condor was suspended 20 feet above the ground. And there were items scattered around the base of the ship. Also scattered about the ship, they found human bones, including a complete skeleton that was enclosed in a jumpsuit. It still had the mouthpiece of the oxygen mask resting between the lower jaw and the upper teeth. Two technicians using ropes climbed up the side of the ship and went in. The Condor was the same class of ship as the Invincible. It was built a few years earlier and in fact they were so identical that they could not be told apart. The two technicians got into the ship, turned on the electricity and lowered the ramp. The outer casing of the ship had been bored and pierced in multiple places. Not very deep, but so closely spaced together that the entire outer body of the ship was dotted with them. When they entered the condor, they found that the first three decks were neat and tidy, but the rest of the ship was in chaos. When they got to the bridge, they saw that not one monitor was intact and in the adjacent library, all of the books were torn up and the microfilm was tangled and unspooled. Everything that could be destroyed was. In one of the bathrooms on deck 8, they found bars of soap with clear marks of human teeth. Yet, there was no hunger because the stores were filled with untouched supplies of food. There was even milk in the refrigerators that was still good. Rohan began heading back to the Invincible, but on the way he was intercepted by a rover that was speeding towards the condor. Apparently after he left the condor, a frozen body was found in the hibernation chamber. So they were heading back to take a look at it. The man in the hibernation chamber was found on the floor of the chamber and he was dead. He was beyond reviving. The doctors put a device called the grave sounder on the man's head. That's what people on the ship called it. To listen or to read the last contents of a brain's consciousness. After using the device himself, Dr. Sachs had Rohan put on the headphones. The last image they found in a man's brain was of half-naked people that had a black mark on their skin like a rash, but the same black marks like karma-shaped dots were also all over the walls and the floors. That was the only image left in his brain and the only words left was Allah, Lala and Mama. Everything else seemed to have been wiped out, which should not have been possible. When Rohan got back to the Invincible to see the captain, he was frightened because the condor had everything that the Invincible did. Energobots, lasers, cannon, yet something happened to them that they couldn't stop. When Rohan got back to the Invincible, the captain had already gotten a hold of the condor's ship's log. He read the last entry to Rohan. It said, at 1840, the second caterpillar patrol returning from the ruins found itself in a local sandstorm with heavy atmospheric discharges. Radio contact was re-established despite interference. The patrol reports the discovery of significant numbers of small flies covering and there it ends. The captain then held a ship's council with all the heads of the departments. They had found a total of 63 bodies, 29 in the area around the ship and 34 in the ship. 
nine of the bodies were mummified. None of the bodies showed any signs of violence. They all died from hunger and thirst, even though there was a plentiful reserve of water and food. They were not poisoned, and the man found in the hibernation chamber simply froze to death, and they found no sign that radiation killed them. They then turned to the damage found on the condor's hull, and they couldn't come up with any ideas of how the hull could have been so damaged and pitted, nor could they explain the reference to flies, since insects could not exist on this planet as it is now. The captain then broke up the meeting and created three teams. One would go to the ruins, the second would go back to the condor, the third would make a series of expeditions into the western desert. Rohan chose to be on the team that went to the ruins. They had just begun their exploration of the ruins when they received word that the commander had ordered them back to the ship immediately. When they got back to the condor, they realized that one of the men that was on the team that went into the western desert had run into trouble. It seems that his memory and his personality were completely wiped out. The only thing left was his automatic responses. Later that night, something began hitting the force field around the ship. They had to be small and was hitting it continuously. Then just as suddenly, before the captain could trap some of them by turning the force field off and on, they stopped. Meanwhile, in the few weeks to follow, Cartilem, that's the name of the man who had his mind wiped, began to learn how to speak. It turns out that his mind had been wiped to the level of a baby, so he'd have to relearn everything. Finally, the captain stopped all examination of the condor and abandoned it because repairing it was beyond the capabilities of the Invincible. Now the team from the condor had joined up with Gallagher's team in the western desert and both things was led by Regna. They made a few discoveries. In between the strata of the sedimentary rock was a layer of black metallic substance that was non-geological and non-planetary in origin. In their research, they found that life on land occurred at least twice. The first time life ended was about 100 million years ago, and they think it was probably the result of a nearby nova. When life finally reappeared, it began dying out again about the same time that the metallic layers appeared, which was between 6 to 8 million years ago. Research continued in trying to find a link between the metallic layer and the eventual extinction of life. Then a massive storm hit the area, and as the storm went out into the ocean, the mining teams began heading back to the Invincible and they found a large number of tiny black metal specks lying in the sand in their path. They took that to be the flies and they collected them and brought them back to the ship where the scientists examined them. The scientists began arguing over what these tiny things were and what they represented. The captain then made a decision to send a fully equipped convoy out to the northeast beyond the area where they've been researching and it was still linked to the invincible via satellite. When they were about a hundred miles away, a massive storm came in and cut off all communications with the Invincible, including satellite communications. It was like someone had dropped a metal bowl over the expedition. When the storm finally died down, there was still no response from the expedition. The captain then sent two reconnaissance craft to take a look. One was two and a half miles up, while the other was a thousand miles up. As the reconnaissance craft got closer to where the expedition was, they came across what looked like a large black wall that stretched 3,000 feet up into the air. As they got closer, it began to look like a cloud. The captain ordered the lower reconnaissance craft to stop before it reached the cloud. That's when suddenly the cloud sent out tentacles that obscured the picture. Reconnaissance 8, which was two and a half miles up, began relaying the picture of what it was seeing. The cloud had engulfed RC-4 and radar shows that it was made of metal. The captain ordered RC-8 to fire a laser into the cloud. 
careful not to have the temperature of the laser be so high as to damage RC4 which was engulfed in the cloud somewhere. The cloud cleared a circle around the area where the laser fire was coming down. Once the sun went down, they could see what looked like a fire raging in the center of the cloud. That was the cloud attacking the first craft after it engulfed it. Then suddenly there was an explosion inside the cloud. That's when a piece of the cloud broke off and began pursuing RC-8, which noticed it and began vertically climbing to escape. RC-8 began firing his lasers at the cloud in an attempt to get it to stop pursuing him. When that failed, he fired the most powerful weapon he had, his antimatter cannon. Then there was an explosion and all picture and signals from RC-8 stopped. The captain then ordered Rohan to take 18 men, equip the supercopter, and go out and look for Ragnar's team. They left and they found Ragnar's team, and of the 22 men that was in Ragnar's team, only 18 were there, and their minds were all completely wiped. Four men were not found, neither were both reconnaissance craft or the Black Cloud. Meanwhile, Dr. Lauda came up with an hypothesis. He believes that millions of years ago, some beings crashed on the planet and the automated machines survived, while these beings all died out. The automated machines then, over millions of years, evolved to become part of the natural forces of the planet. Over the millions of years, they killed off all competition on land, leaving only life in the oceans. The winners in this evolutionary race evolved to be tiny and numerous and banded together for protection, similar to insects only all operating under a single mind. The argument among the scientists was whether this single mind was intelligent or just instinctual. The captain then tried to get in contact with Rohan's team but was told by Garb that Rohan left only seven men behind and took the rest of the team to go and investigate something and he hasn't returned yet. Just then they saw lights approaching and God told the captain that they looked like they were returning. The captain said he'd be waiting and that Rohan would have to answer for this. It turned out that only one vehicle was returning instead of the six that had left. It was a small three-man reconnaissance amphibian radio vehicle. Rohan was the only passenger and once he was safe and rested, he recounted the story of what happened. When Rohan left, he had 12 men traveling in six vehicles, traveling on a degree three procedures for full protection. He also had two Energobots that would provide force field protection, one in front and one in the back. Rohan decided on this expedition because he had found the trail of Ragnar's four missing men. Rohan and his team followed the four men into a ravine. As the ravine got steeper, they came across strange metal bushes that were on both sides of the ravine. Between the bushes, they found some entrances to caves, and in one of the caves, they found small triangular crystals that were partly buried, and Rohan pocketed a couple. As they went deeper into the ravine, the more of these strange bushes that they found. As they went deeper into the ravine, they began noticing some magnetic impulses coming from every direction. A closer look made them realize that the magnetic impulses was coming from the bushes that were lying in the ravine. And they noticed that those bushes were slightly different from the ones they saw earlier. They were taller and blacker and didn't have the rusty coat of the earlier ones. Soon, Rohan and his team reach a part of the ravine that was too narrow for them to pass through without first turning off the force shield. So they decided they would turn off the force shield, pass through, and then turn it right back on. But that's the last manned vehicle went through, but before they could turn back on the rear force shield, they felt a shaking as if a big boulder had dropped, and from the sides of the ravine, a black smoke seemed to rise up into the air. The first Energobat had its force field on and you could see this black smoke hitting the force shield and bursting into flames. The part of the cloud that was not attacking the first Energobat descended on the other manned machines. 
Rohan yelled for Jar to turn on the rear Enigo bats for shield, but when he tried, it didn't come on, so he got scared and jumped and ran away. Rohan tried to turn it on himself, but by then he was too late. The men in the transporters had all jumped down. I was running off in every direction as they tried to escape the cloud. Pretty soon the men stopped running and just sat there. And the cloud divided itself into individual funnels and came down over the heads of the men. And once that was done, the cloud then went back and settled onto the rocks at the side of the ravine. One of the men were killed when mindless men began playing with laser weapons and killed one of them. Soon Rohan was the only one left that still had his full cognitive abilities. He managed to tie all nine survivors together and turn on both four shields, leaving the men inside as he headed back to get help. So within 27 days of being on the planet, Almost half of the Invincible's crew was incapacitated. Once Rohan was back in the Invincible, the captain had to decide what to do. They were in possession of a handful of metallic insects that Rohan had brought back with him. The captain of course wanted to leave, but he felt he couldn't justify leaving the four men that were still missing to die. They were able to go and get the men that Rohan had tied up and bring them safely back to the Invincible. They began examining the metallic insects and they found that individually they were not very dangerous but at the first sign of danger they would come together and the bigger the threat the more of them that would get together. Each one looked like the letter Y with three arms. Each one could connect with three others and they could either connect directly or get close enough that their magnetic fields began to interact with each other so that they all act as one. Individually, they don't fly so much as drift in the warm air, but as they begin to come together, the more of them there were, the more aerodynamic they became. And when they did, they were capable of changing direction, shape, structure, and frequency of internal impulses. The experiments could not be continued because the scientists only had a handful of the metallic insects of which to study. The scientists told the captain they needed more time to conduct their test and they needed more of these insects. So they proposed sending an expedition into the ravine so that while they searched for the missing men, they could also collect thousands of samples. So to do that, the captain decided to use the Cyclops, which was an automated machine that measured 25 feet by 12 feet in diameter. It was a machine that was very rarely used. The Cyclops set off. When it reached the area of the ravine where Rohan's men were attacked, that's where the cloud attacked it. The battle raged until the cloud had covered the entire ravine. Finally, the Cyclops began using its antimatter cannons, but still the battle raged. Finally, the Cyclops began to retreat out of the ravine. Once it was out of the ravine, the cloud stopped attacking it and went back into the ravine, and the Cyclops began heading back towards the Invincible. But as they examined it, they realized there was something wrong. It was no longer obeying commands. And whenever they sent a reconnaissance craft to observe it, it would shoot it down. The scientists believed that the cloud used magnetism to affect the computer's brain. The Cyclops drifted off into the northern desert. Later that night, it came back and attacked the ship, and the captain destroyed it with an atomic bomb. Later, the captain and Rohan decided that Rohan would go out and look for the four missing men on his own. He would be wearing a net that would be designed to mask his brain activity. While they both believed that the men were probably already dead, they had to try and go and verify that information. They would send three jeeps, one in which Rohan would be, the other two would be decoys to hopefully pull the cloud away from Rohan. An hour later, Rohan was on his way. The plan worked. The two jeeps were able to decoy the cloud, allowing Rohan time to get close to the ravine. A couple of times, the cloud came out and seeming to look around, but each time it dissipated. The third time, the cloud came right over Rohan as he lay there silently. It reached down with one tentacle and touched him before once more going back up and dissipating. The next time he saw the cloud, 
two of them came up together and joined and then reflected an image of him and the surrounding desert. The cloud then formed a sphere before other clouds came up out of the ravine, joined it, and then it dissipated. Rohan went on to find the four bodies before returning to the invincible. Along the way, he ran out of air in his tank and had to rely on breathing the natural air of the planet. He made it back to the invincible, and that's how the book ends. I'd like to thank you for watching and listening. I'd like to ask you to subscribe if you haven't. Give us a thumbs up, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.